hello everyone welcome back welcome to the channel if this is your first time you're very welcome on this channel we discuss the bible and the happenings in our contemporary society through the lens of the scripture so today we're going to be talking about homosexuality but if you're just joining us please subscribe we have many videos that we've already done recently we've been looking at um, the spiritual things so we've looked at why you should not visit a witch or a native doctor we also looked at the spiritual side of sex but we had part one and we've also done a part two on the spiritual side of sex so even though the video is titled why women or why it's more important for women to be virgins is actually part two of the spiritual side of sex so if you haven't watched those videos please go back watch them you will be blessed if you watch them and you do not share them with your friends don't be greedy don't be blessed alone share them with your friends so now that we've gotten the introduction out of the way let's get into what we're talking about today also on this channel we're doing a book by book study of the bible It's very in-depth um, we spend maybe close to an hour or more on each book of the bible on each chapter sorry in each in the books of the bible so we've gone through genesis we did genesis 1 up to the end we also we've also gone through exodus from the start to the finish so if you're looking for a place where you can get a comprehensive in-depth understanding of the scriptures please subscribe we'll be starting leviticus sometime in the future so in case you've been confused or it's not really been clear to you what the Bible teaches at, about homosexuality, today to be very clear to you, after this teaching to be very clear, I've seen some pastors in quote online painting a picture and making it look as if homosexuality is a gray area in the Bible, in the scripture. So how they present it to their audiences, it's not really black and white. It's not really that clear but at the end of today's teaching you will see what the bible teaches so let us quickly pray before we start father we ask that you bring deliverance through this teaching we ask that you open the eyes of our understanding i command every shade every cover that is stopping people from understanding what the bible says i command it to be removed now and let there be clarity and understanding in jesus name amen so let us start from the beginning in genesis chapter 2 from verse 21 the bible says and the lord god caused a deep sleep to fall on adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof and the rib which the lord god had taken from man he made a woman and brought her unto the man and adam said this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. So the reason I'm starting from the beginning is the beginning of the Bible is a time of perfection. It's a time where God's perfect will was done where everything that was created and everything that was in existence was very good it's different from the time where we are now where many things that are on the earth are not good there are things on the earth god did not create and there are things on the earth god did not intend so everything we see on the earth has been tainted corrupted and it's not god's perfect will but back in the garden of eden there was no satan or Satan hadn't, his influence had not been exerted on the world. So many of the things that we suffer today as a result of Satan's influence on the world were not there. So in the Garden of Eden, there was no pain. There was no crying. There were no tears. There was no depression. There was no hunger. There was no famine. There was no nightmares. There were no nightmares. There were no demonic attacks. There was no drought, there were no tornadoes, no floods. It was basically heaven on earth. There was nothing that was bad. There was nothing that was not good. There was nothing that was not God's will. So the Garden of Eden 
at the beginning before sin was introduced is a perfect place to understand god's will concerning man and woman not just man and woman but concerning many other things when you see if you can understand how creation operated before sin was introduced you'll be able to understand what god thinks about so many things on the earth and god's perspective but today we're narrowing it down to the relations between a man and a woman so when when god created man in his wisdom he gave him a woman not another man he gave him a woman in his wisdom in his knowledge in his perfection and we know god is wiser than each of us and he knows far more than we can even comprehend so in his wisdom he gave him a woman so we can see that god's perfect will has always and will always be a man married to a woman this is also for people who are still arguing about polygamy so people talk about solomon married many wives david married many wives jacob married many wives etc etc but in the garden of eden god didn't give adam two women he didn't give him three or four women he gave him one woman so god's will is one man one woman not one man and four women and it's a man and a woman secondly it says a man shall cleave to the woman and he shall be she will be his they shall be one flesh he says a man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife and they will be one flesh so in the bible the wife has always been a woman whether in the old testament whether in the new testament anybody who was called a wife was always a woman that's point number two let's look at another scripture leviticus chapter 18 verse 22 it says thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind it is an abomination so he's saying a man should not lie lie means it's talking about sexual intimacy so it says a man should not have sexual relations with him another man as if he's doing it with a woman in other words sexual relations up is prohibited between a man and his fellow man or a woman and her fellow woman somebody is going to say oh but that was under the law that's the old testament all right let's go to the new testament first corinthians chapter 6 i'll read the kjv first then we'll look at other translations first corinthians chapter 6 verse 9 this is apostle paul warning the corinthian church it says know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of god be not deceived neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers nor effeminate nor abusers of themselves with mankind so kgv says no abusers of themselves with mankind but what this actually means is homosexuals let's see another translation that puts it in a way that it'll be easier for us to understand so let's look at the nkgv it says do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of god do not be deceived neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers nor homosexuals nor sodomites let's look at the nlt don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of god don't fool yourselves those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or who commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality so homosexuality is unacceptable unto unto god it's very clear there are actually other scriptures that talk about this but the lord just led me to use only this this one and the one in leviticus but there are other scriptures that talk about how homosexuality is unacceptable before god so it says fornicators idolaters idol adulterers will not inherit the kingdom of god so the only way homosexuality is not a sin 
is if fornication is not a sin. Because it says the fornicators or the sexually immoral will not inherit the kingdom of God. So the only way homosexuality will not be a sin is if fornicators, fornication is not a sin. Then he goes on to say, he goes on to say, nor idolaters. So do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters. So if idol worship is a sin, then homosexuality is also a sin. Then he goes on to say, nor adulterers. So if you think it's okay if somebody sleeps with your wife without, I mean, if someone just takes your wife and starts sleeping with her, if you think it's fine, and if you, God also thinks adultery is fine, God doesn't mind adultery, then God also does not mind homosexuality. So if fornication is a sin, homosexuality is a sin. If idolatry is a sin, homosexuality is a sin. If adultery is a sin, homosexuality is also a sin. So let's go back to the NKJ, to the KJV. It says, do not be deceived or be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. So, we've talked about how abusers of themselves with mankind means homosexuals. We saw it in the other translations, how what the King James calls abusers of themselves with mankind are homosexuals. But what does the word effeminate mean? So what it means, or what it means in the KJV, in the word that is translated effeminate, does not mean what we think it means today. Today, it, it means a man who is a bit soft and who has who's, who behaves like a woman, basically. That's what effeminate means today. But that's not what that's not what it meant. The word that is translated effeminate in the KJV, that's not what it means. So let's look at what the word effeminate means. So you can see at the top of your screen, you can see the effeminate from the KJV. The word is malakois. And it means soft or catamite. What it really means is catamite. So what does it mean? to be catamite. So, a catamite. In ancient Greece and Rome, a catamite was a pubescent boy who was the intimate companion of an older male, usually in a pederastic relationship. It says a catamite in ancient Greece and Rome was a pubescent boy who was the intimate companion of an older male, usually in a pederastic relationship. So what is pederasty? Or what does the word pederastic mean? It says pederasty is a sexual relationship between an adult man and a boy. It was a socially acknowledged practice in ancient Greece and Rome and elsewhere in the world. So in the days of Apostle Paul, there was a practice whereby the men would look for younger men or young boys. They call them pubescent boys. So when I say boy, I don't really mean somebody who is like four years old or five years old. I mean somebody who is in his teens, like 16, 17, 18. So a young teenager, basically. And they, they basically had sex with this boy. So these boys were, they were trained to be women basically they prepared these boys groomed them and all they used them for was intimacy they were groomed to be like in like like a high class escort but somebody who was dedicated to a particular man so a man will look for a young boy and groom him bring him to his house make sure he's taken care of make sure his skin is very soft make sure he's fed well and basically just be sleeping with him so this is what Apostle Paul is, this is what the word catamite means. But how Apostle Paul uses it in, let's go back to the scriptures. So it says, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. So the one who is an abuser of himself with mankind is a homosexual. Is a, a homosexual. The one who is effemi effeminate is like the one who 
is the woman in the relationship. So these boys who were brought up, right, they were always like the women. I'm trying not to be graphic, but I have no choice but so that you can understand what I'm saying. So basically, the men penetrated these boys. So these boys were just the ones on the receiving end of the sexual relationship. So they became like the women in the relationship. The one who was a catamite was the one who is only the woman in the relationship. The one who is an abuser of himself with mankind, who is an, a homosexual, he goes both ways. So why I'm explaining this to you is that I need you to understand that the Bible is so specific that homosexuality is a sin. It's so specific that it has two different words to describe the one who, who's, who is only receiving and the one who is both giving and receiving. I need you to understand that the Bible is so specific when talking about the sin of homosexuality that it has two different words to describe the one who says, I just want to be receiving. And another word to describe the one who is both who is doing both of them. So I know your pastor didn't teach you this. Because many watered down, compromised pastors now just make it look at oh, make it look as if it's a gray area. God is not very specific, but it's that specific that there are two different words for it. So let's look at some of the objections to homosexuality. Usually when this topic is brought up, the first thing that comes up is, I was born this way. Therefore, God made me like this. The first thing I'm going to say is, because somebody was born in a particular way, does not mean that that's how God made him. Because a baby came out in a particular way does not mean that that's how God made the baby. The only people who came out exactly the way God wanted them were Adam and Eve. There's nobody else who has been born on this earth after Adam and Eve that came out in the exact, when I say exact, I mean 100% way that God intended them to come out. So Adam and Eve came out perfectly exactly how God wanted them, not just spiritually in the fact that they were, they were created without sin, but even physically, their physical features, the way their eyes looked, the way their hair looked, the way their nose looked, the way their mouth looked, the, how tall they were, how short they were, was exactly how God wanted them to be. Because the Bible says that God took the dust and formed the man. So God took dust and he used his hands to craft Adam. So God was the sculptor of Adam. He built Adam by himself. So Adam came out exactly the way he wanted him to be. When it was time for Eve, the Bible says God took a rib from the man and formed the woman. So Adam and Eve were literally created with the hand of God. So the way they were born or created was the exact way, even down to their physical features. It was the exact way God wanted them to be created. But everybody else was not created by God in that sense. They were actually born. And the fact that you were born means that some other things have interrupted your development. The way that God made you or the way that God intended is not the way you came out even down to your physical features. There are things that have interrupted the way God wanted you to come out even down to your physical features so let's look at this particular article please forgive the noise so this article says six six factors that can affect your baby's appearance so i'll skip the first factor it says travel it says a pregnant woman who travels extensively by aeroplane may be exposed to unhealthy radiation levels a developing fetus should not be exposed to radiation as it could adversely affect their appearance. Caffeine. Excessive caffeine during pregnancy may affect a newborn's birth weight, resulting in smaller and slimmer newborn than resulting in a smaller and slimmer newborn than normal. Alcohol. This is a new brain, no brainer. Alcohol consumption during pregnancy may cause fetal alcohol syndrome, a 
according to studies. Developing fetuses with this syndrome may be born with unusual facial characteristics such as small eyes and thin lips. As well as affecting a child's cognitive development, it can negatively impact their behavior. Mother's sugar levels. While pregnancy cravings are perfectly normal, you may want to cut down on sweets if you do not want sugar consumption to affect your baby's appearance and overall health. This extra sugar can be stored as fat in the baby, placing them at a higher risk of obesity, diabetes, and jaundice. Environmental factors. A baby's birth weight can be affected by dirty or contaminated air. Researchers have found that for every 10 micrograms increase in air pollution per cubic meter of air, the average birth mass decreased by 8.9 grams. So the point is, a baby is born, so for instance, when people look at themselves and they don't believe that they are beautiful. So they look in the mirror and they don't think they are beautiful or they don't think they are handsome. And they place the blame on God and say, God made me this way. So God made this person beautiful. But when I look at myself in the mirror, I don't like the way I look. And they lay the blame on God because God created everybody. Therefore, God made me to look, in quote, ugly. But I'm here to tell you that it's not good. nobody came out the way God wanted them to be. There are many things that can impact how babies are born, even down to their looks. Many times it's a result of genes and even the decisions that their parents made. So there are many more factors that affect how a child is born, even up to their looks. But we can't go through all of them because that's not what this video is about. I just showed you a bit so you understand what I'm saying. So somebody being born gay or a homosexual does not mean that that was God's original intention for the person. We have seen from the scriptures that every person who was a wife was called a man. We have seen that homosexuality is a sin and God outlaws it both in the Old and the New Testament. And we have also seen that God created Adam and Eve. So God's intention has always been a man and a woman. So why are some people born with the with same-sex attraction, basically? There are some reasons why some people are born with same-sex same -sex attraction. We've actually looked at one of them, but I haven't, I haven't explained it, so it's not clear. So let's get into it. The Bible talks about how the sins of the father can affect the children. It talks about how the sins of the father can affect the children. And it also talks about how a particular sin, right, a particular trait can be passed down from a father to his son or to his daughter. Or the effect of a man's sin can be seen on the children. So some people are homosexuals today or were born homosexuals because of their parents' lifestyles or the choices their parents made or the kind of the way their parents lived resulted in the child being born with same-sex attraction. Not because that's how God created him or her, but because of the way their parents lived. So we've even seen on a physical level how a child's appearance, his weight, his eyes, his lips, and even his tendency to be obese in future is determined or affected by the mother's, for instance, alcohol levels, how much she travels by airplane, how much caffeine she took, how much sugar she took while she was pregnant. So that's on a physical level, how the tendency of a child, his looks and all the other things that we read can be affected by a parent. That's on a physical level. But on a spiritual level, because we're discussing sin now, right? And sin is not something that is physical. Sin is spiritual. And it's possible that either a particular sin, the tendency can be passed from a parent to the child, or the parent could have lived a particular lifestyle that opens the child up to that kind of sin. So we see this right from the very first man, whose name was Adam. Right, we are all sinners because Adam was a sinner. So Adam's sin has been passed down to all of us. Right, when a child is born, he's already a sinner. 
before he even does anything because his father Adam was a sin. So apart from general sin, specific sins can be passed down from father to children. Either that or the effect of a parent's lifestyle can affect a child. So let's look at a particular scripture that buttresses this point. John, this is Jesus and his disciples, were having a conversation particularly concerning a particular man who was born blind. So John chapter 1, 1 to 2, or 1 to 3. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered and said, Neither had this man sinned, nor his parents. So a man was blind. And Jesus' disciples approached Jesus and said, This man was blind right from when he was born. Keep in mind that Jesus is a spiritual man, right? He teaches from the realm of the spirit, not just medical or in physical terms. He's teaching from the realm of the spirit. So they asked him, follow me very carefully. The assumption by the disciples was that sin can make this man be born blind, that he didn't do anything, right? That his parents can sin. And because of his parents' sin, he will come out blind. That's the assumption. And Jesus did not see this assumption was wrong. So they said, who sinned that this man was born blind? Is it that his parents sinned or is it that he's the one that sinned? And Jesus said, none of them sinned. He said, none of them sinned. So imagine this scenario. Somebody comes to me and said, who parked your car here? Was it you or your wife? It's possible it's the driver who parked the car. So I'll say, none of us parked the car here. Somebody comes to me and says, who parked your car here? I will say, and the person will ask, was it you who parked it here or was it your wife? So it's possible the driver is the one who parked it or my brother is the one who parked it. So my response to him will be, neither of us parked it because it is possible for us to park it. But if somebody comes to me and says, your car is on the roof, your car is on top of the roof, who put your car on the roof? Was it you or your wife? My response to that person would be, this is a crazy question. Because there's no human being who can put a car on a roof. There's nobody who is strong enough to lift the car from the, from the floor, then jump up with the car and put it on a roof. So if somebody asks me, who put this car on your roof? My res- was it you or your wife? My response would be, this is a crazy question. It's not possible for either of us to put it on the roof. So going back to Jesus' response to his disciples, Jesus did not tell them that this is a crazy question. Neither did, he just, did Jesus say, it's not possible for his parents' sin to actually make him be born blind. Jesus did not say that. That it's not possible for his parents' sin to make him be born blind. Jesus said, is not a result of his sin or his parents' sin. But Jesus did not say it cannot be because of his parents' sin. So it is actually possible for the guy to be born blind because of his parents' sin. We see an example of this in the scriptures. When Gehazi, if you've not read it, please go and read it. When Gehazi, Elisha's servant, went to collect the goods of Naaman. So, if you've not read the story, Naaman, after being healed of leprosy, came to Elisha, brought some money, gold, silver, and gifts, and presented it to Elisha to appreciate him for healing him of leprosy. And Elisha told him he doesn't want the money, basically. So Naaman should take the money and go back home. So Naaman, when he was taking the money back, Gehazi ran after Naaman and went to lie to Naaman that Elisha has changed his mind and that Elisha now wants the money. So Naaman should give him Gehazi the money. So Elisha gave, Ge- sorry, Naaman released the money to Gehazi and Gehazi took the money to go and hide it and spend it by himself. When he came back to Elisha, Elisha said, I didn't go with you physically, but my spirit went with you. I saw you in the spirit when you went to lie 
and say that I sent you to collect the money, but I didn't send you, you went to lie. So Elisha now told him that because of what you have done, he says, the leprosy of Naaman will be upon you and upon your generations and your generations to come. So basically, Elisha said, because of this sin, this lie, you went to lie and say that it's me that sent you to collect the money. You will become a leper and your children will become lepers. So everybody in Gehazi's generation will be born with leprosy. And when they are born with leprosy, 200, 300 years to come, Somebody will look at them and say, wow, this is, a, is a, it's just a genetic disease. It's a congenital disease. It's, it's, just, it's just genetics. You know, it's not his fault. It's just things just happened. You know, the world is not perfect. And if someone says, ah, is it possible that he, the guy sinned or his parents, is, is, is his parents that sinned? They'll say, no, it's just, a, it's just a birth defect. It's not about anybody's sin. But it was because of Gehazi's sin. It wasn't just a birth defect in quotes. So the sins of the fathers can be visited upon the children. That's the point I'm making. So going back to homosexuality, somebody can be born homosexual. If his parent is a homosexual, that's one. He will come out a homosexual. Or he can come out a homosexual. If one of his parents was a homosexual, practicing homosexual. He can also come out a homosexual if one of his parents is a closet homosexual. So his parents are married, his father married a woman, but either his father is a closet homosexual, he's married, but inside he's a homosexual. He has homosexual tendencies that he has not displayed. So he's outwardly, he looks straight, but he has homosexual tendencies. His child can be born a homosexual. A child can also be born homosexual if one of his parents had a homosexual encounter before they give birth to the child. So somebody is in college and he just says, okay, let me just swing, you know, let me just have fun. Let me, a man, let me just sleep with another man. Or a woman says, let me just sleep with another woman. Let me just do it once. Let me just taste it. Let me just see how it is. And he just did it once or twice. And he said, okay, I've tried it. I'm going back to my street lifestyle. That's homosexual contact has become a point of contact and is there many times the people don't even repent of this thing they just do it once twice and they just move on and they never really went to god and say god i'm so sorry i tried this thing it's, it's a sin and even and the reason i stopped it is not because i think it's a sin no. it's because it's just not for me i don't have that attraction so they did it long ago they never repented they didn't stop doing it because they thought God doesn't like it. They stopped doing it because they didn't enjoy it or they think, oh, it's better to be married to a man or to a woman and it's just not for me. So they didn't repent of the sin. So that thing becomes a stronghold. And even though it may not be able to affect them, it will affect their children. Anybody who's in the medical field knows about dominant and recessive genes. And how a gene that is recessive in one of the parents can become dominant in the children. So somebody can have a homosexual encounter and even be having little, little homosexual urges and just push it away. Because now he believes it's straight. But when he gives birth to a child, the child will come out homosexual. Other times, it can be a result of occultic encounters. So playing with Ouija boards visiting a psychic, visiting the fortune teller, all those kind of things that look like magic, but they are, people think they are jokes, so it's just, it's just astrology, it's just astrology, it's just a fortune teller, it's just a psychic, I just went to get my palm read, I just played with a Ouija board, I just looked at my horoscope, I just tried reading some tarot, tarot cards, all those kind of demonic things that people should not tamper with. When people play with those things, right, because they are spiritual, it's not just a joke. Those things can create openings, right, doors for spirits to lay hold on somebody. And when those spirits come, sometimes the target is the children. It's not really the person himself. So the person may not feel the impact or the effect of whatever he or she has done. But that spirit is able to manipulate the sexual orientation of the child. 
The second objection when it comes to homosexuality is basically the gorillas do it, therefore it's okay for human beings to also do it. Basically, it goes something like the chimpanzees do it. And since human beings are close cousins with chimpanzees, therefore, since the animals do it, the beasts of the field do it, therefore, it is okay for human beings to also do it. It's, it's just natural. Since the animals who we are closely related to, in quotes, also do it. So it's natural for us to do it. But let's, let us examine this argument from the lens of Scripture. Genesis chapter 1, verse 24. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and the beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. So this is discussing the creation of the animals, right? When God wanted to create the animals, I didn't read from verse 21. You can read it by yourself or from verse 20. You can read it by yourself. But when God was about to create the animals in verse 24, which we read, it says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. So God spoke to the earth. And the earth brought forth the animals. God just spoke, right? And from the from the earth, animals just came out of the earth. It says, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. And that's how the animals were created. If you read from verse 20, the Bible says, and God said, let the waters bring forth the moving creature that hath life. And the fowl that may fly up above the earth in the open firmament of the heaven. So when God wanted to create it, to create the animals, excuse me, he spoke. For some of the animals, he spoke to the water, like the birds. Every bird came out of the water. So the chicken, the eagle, the dove, etc. God spoke to the water, and some of the animals came out of the water. The, the water basically gave birth to some of the animals, like fish, like birds, etc. For other animals like cattle, like lions, like tigers, the Bible says God spoke to the earth and the earth brought out those animals. So to be clear, when God wanted to create the animals, he spoke and the animals came out. Let's continue. Verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. And in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So when God wanted to create man, he said, let us make man in our image. He didn't say this for any of the animals. Right, so this is one of the differences between a man and an animal. Animals are not created in the image of God. But men are created in the image of God. Let us continue. Genesis chapter 2. From verse 7 it says and the lord god formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul so this is another difference between a man and an animal the bible says god formed the man so god took dust and with his hands he formed the man he fashioned a man from the dust with his hands. The hand of God touched the man and formed him. But with the animals, God didn't touch any of the animals. He just spoke. All he did was speak, and the animals came out. It says, And the Lord formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. 
So another difference is God breathed into the man his own breath, but he did not breathe his breath into the animals. The breath of God is inside every man, but God did not breathe into the animals. So biblical differences between a man and a chimpanzee. Number one, God spoke when he wanted to create chimpanzees, but God formed man with his hand. Number two, God breathed into the man. God did not breathe into any of the animals. And number three, man is made in the image of God. Animals are not made in the image of God. So according to science, the chimpanzee is your long-lost cousin because you evolved, you evolved from a chimpanzee. But if you're a Bible-believing Christian, you didn't evolve from any chimpanzee because there's a clear demarcation between how a man was created and how beasts were created. Therefore, an animal sleeping with another animal or a male chimpanzee sleeping with a male chimpanzee, a male dog sleeping with another male dog, or a female chicken sleeping with a female chicken, is not an excuse for a human being to do the same. Animals are not your long lost cousins, no matter what science tells you. Men are made in the image of God. There's a clear demarcation between something that's in the image of God and something that is not in the image of God. Job chapter 39. I'm going to read from verse 13. It says, this is God speaking to Job. It says, Givest thou the goodly wings unto the peacocks, or wings and feathers unto the ostrich, which liveth, liveth her eggs in the, in the earth, and warmeth them in the dust, and forgetteth that the foot may crush them, or that the wild beasts may break them. She is hardened against her young ones, as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without fear, because God hath deprived her of wisdom, neither hath he imparted to her understanding. So God is speaking about the ostrich. He says the ostrich, he says she leaves her eggs in the dust. She leaves them in the earth and warms them in the dust. She forgets that the foot may crush them or that the wild beast may break them. So in other words, an ostrich will lay her eggs and can leave the eggs and just run away and forget about the eggs. Forgetting that other wild animals can come and trample upon the eggs and kill the eggs. He says she is hardened against her young ones. In other words, she doesn't take care of the eggs. She just leaves them. But the Bible now gives us the reason why she does this. Why she can lay eggs and forget the eggs and just run away. It says, because God hath deprived her of wisdom, neither hath he imparted to her understanding. It says, God has deprived her of wisdom, neither hath he imparted to her understanding. So the reason an ostrich can lay the eggs and forget the eggs and just, just go and mind her business, because there's a level of wisdom that God gave men that God did not give animals. So, my brother has a dog. And one day I was taking the dog for a walk and we got to a part of the road where there was dirt. So Spirogyra was on the floor, right? And the other part of the road was clean. There was nothing on the road. So this dog was taking a walk and instead of him to turn and pass the side of the road, just, just the patches were side by side. So the dirty patch, the patch with the Spirogyra and the patch with clean ground. Why, um, he, instead of him to just pass the path where there was no spirogyra, this dog climbed on top of the spirogyra and just kept going. He left the clean path and stepped on top of the spirogyra. And I wanted to complain that, is this dog crazy? Why are you stepping this disgusting thing when there is clean, but I just clean ground by the side. But I remember the scripture that God has deprived the dog of understanding. Another day, I was trying to, I was doing something with water, right? And some of the water poured on the floor. And the dog immediately started leaking the water from the floor. Like water that just splashed on the floor, just leaking the floor. And I'm like, why will you lick the floor? Why, even if water upon on the floor, why are you licking the floor? But God has deprived the dog of understanding. So we don't copy beasts, basically. That's what I'm saying. You don't say because if, if, if monkey is sleeping with a monkey, therefore human beings should sleep with monkeys. Or if, because a male monkey is sleeping with another male monkey, therefore... A male man can sleep with another male man. 
if we are going to take that route of copying animals then we should just take it to the extreme okay look at this monkey living in a tree maybe i should get up out of my house move out sell my 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 flat and go and live in a tree somewhere look at this pig rolling in the mud Maybe I should just, you know, take off, just jump in any, any muddy part I can find, any gutter I can find, just jump in and just be comfortable inside the mud like this, like this pig. Look at this gorilla moving around stark naked. Maybe I should take off my clothes and arrive at my office on Monday completely naked. Oh, look at this rat. Some animals eat their own feces. So how about I shit in a plate, pick a fork and knife, put some water by the side and eat my own shit. Look at this lion tearing this antelope to pieces. Why don't I just come out of my house, go into my neighbor's house, stab him to death, cut off his hand, cook it, and enjoy a good meal? Oh, see, some animals also kill their children. They kill their children. Maybe we as human beings should start killing our own children. Oh, wait. So, the point is, we don't copy beasts. We do not. Animals should even be learning from humans. Humans should not be copying animals. Now, if you've been privileged to see the representation of the spirit of homosexuality, it looks like a wolf. One day while I was praying, the Lord showed me a wolf. But this wolf did not look like normal wolves that we see on earth. It was very thin. It was very, very thin. It, it was ugly. It was exceedingly ugly. It looked like it had been in a fight. Like it had been in a fight with other beasts, other animals. And the animals had injured it, had badly injured it. They had bitten it in different places. They had even torn off some of its flesh. So, so the most of its flesh was missing, had been bitten off by, it looked like it had been bitten off by other animals. Most of its flesh was missing. The flesh that was there was decaying, like rotting. It's like it was getting rotten when it was alive. It was like dead and rotten, but it was alive. So it was a, it was a wolf, but it was thin. It was rotten. It was decaying. It had chunks of his flesh missing it was very ugly it was evil it looked evil it was very vicious very angry sadistic looking beast and then i asked the lord lord what am i looking at and i will show you what the lord showed me so i'm going to talk about the movie twilight twilight so this is not an advertisement for the movie if you haven't watched it please do not go and watch it i'm not advertising it I'm not recommending it i'm just using it to make a point so i'm going to talk about the movie twilight but you can i think you can relate this to many other movies about werewolves that you have watched so if you notice movies about werewolves the werewolves are mostly men they are almost always men. And they are a group of men. So in Twilight, the guy had like other wolves that were werewolves with him, but they were all men. And the men, when you see them pose, they're always looking gay. They're shirtless. Sometimes they polish their skin. I don't know, maybe they rub oil on the skin or they pour water on the skin. So it looks kind of seductive. They are wearing shorts. Many times the shorts are very tight. Tight, very tight shorts. So a pack of men, all men, all men. Shirtless, tight shorts looking like strippers with with their skin oiled so i blurred it out because i don't want it's inappropriate and i don't want people to start getting thoughts that they're not supposed to get but if you've watched the movie you will know what i'm talking about 
So this group of men have an urge inside them. An urge that nobody else knows about. They have an urge. There's something that is roaring on the inside of them. Nobody knows about it, but they know about it. Just like homosexuals, before now, before now, when in, when before now that is accepted, there was an urge, there is a feeling. They want to go after, I want to sleep with other men. But other people don't know, so they know, but other people they know. So these wolves who have this urge now begin to locate other men like them who are also werewolves. Just like homosexuals, before now that it became accepted, they now start saying, in secret, where are other men who have the same urge? Let us come together. Let us congregate. Let us share our struggles. So if you watch these movies, especially this Twilight or the movies about werewolves, the men come together and they begin to talk about the struggle of controlling the wolf that is inside them. So, at night is when these wolves transform. So the men turn into wolves at night or under the cover of darkness where people will not see them, when nobody will know. They go and transform and allow the urge to come out. That's just how, that's like how before now, homosexuals under the cover of night or darkness in places where people will not see, where people will not notice, where it will not be found out. They come out and allow their urge to be, to be seen. If you also notice in these werewolf movies, there's a stigma attached to being a werewolf. Just like there was a stigma attached to being a homosexual. These werewolves had a stigma. There was the, the people did not like them because of something that they are. Just like homosexuals too, also had the same stigma before now that it's accepted. So some of these wolves too, they don't they did or these werewolves, they didn't know how they became werewolves. They didn't know. They were just born and maybe they were living their lives normally. They maybe in their twenties. They just suddenly notice that they are changing into something else. That's how many people who are gay now also did not know that they were homosexuals. Just like these werewolves, they grew up normally. And all of a sudden, in their teens, in their twenties, they started noticing that they are, in quotes, not attracted to others, the other sex. They are attracted to their own sex. If you also notice, there is a battle between the man and the wolf. So the man is trying to make sure that he doesn't turn into a werewolf. He's struggling against the the urge to become a werewolf, to allow that werewolf to come out. He doesn't want it. If you watch these movies at the beginning, you know, they really don't want it. They are first before they eventually accept it. They don't want it. They're trying to hide it. They don't like it. They're trying to cover it and etc. etc. So I need you to know that in the realm of the spirits, right? Animals depict spirits. It's only people that lack understanding that think that animals are just animals. If you notice the vision of Ezekiel, he saw a cherub, right? And he said this cherub had four faces. The face of a man, the face of an ox, the face of an eagle, and the face of a lion. So those animals are depicting various dimensions of the ox. The serpent, as an animal, is representative of Satan. It's not just an animal. So when you see some of these animals in some of these movies, it's not just an animal. It's really representative of his spirit. 
That's why if you see a snake in your dream, you don't wake up and go, it's just a snake. It's never just a snake. It's never just a snake. So, some of you have become gay by watching movies like this. When the Bible says that we should come out of the world, come out of Babylon and touch not the unclean thing. Some people think it's a joke that it's harmless, but it's not harmless. Some of you are battling with homosexual urges now. You're straight, but in your mind, your mind is beginning to flash. How would it be like if I if I touch my fellows, if I just try it once, if I just... Urges are coming out from places that you never knew. And you are wondering where it came from. I'm trying to show you where some of these things came from. So these things are representative of spirits. So, going back to the movie, after struggling to contain the wolf, trying to make sure they don't transform, trying to make sure they stay human, trying to not let it out, in time comes where a new narrative is built where the people slowly become to, they become they start to accept the fact that they are not normal they slowly in the closet of their werewolfness they start to accept the fact that i'm not like everybody else there's something inside me that's not normal but instead of fighting it slowly these wolves are taught to embrace it to say it's just part of me that's how it is so the wolves embrace their werewolf nature in secret at first. They embrace it in secret at first. Then after a while, if you watch these movies, they just come out and they just announce to everybody that I'm a werewolf, so what? Now after the werewolves come out the closet and show everybody that they are now werewolves, they begin to accept their nature as a werewolf but the funny thing is when you watch these movies you notice that it's not fun being a werewolf so the nature takes over them consumes them and eventually the nature makes them do things that they will not have done in their right mind. So they, they, they start by tearing their clothes, the werewolves, they tear their clothes, strip themselves naked, begin to howl like an animal in the middle of the night. Then the wolf goes around, right, running through the city, committing all sorts of atrocities, killing people, drinking their blood, Sometimes even hurting the person's own family member. So the person who has turned to a wolf, when he becomes a wolf, he can even kill his family members, kill his girlfriend, kill his wife, kill his children, run through the city, drink a lot of blood, just basically misbehave. Then when he comes back to his senses, he doesn't remember what he has done. Now, in some movies, um, they paint it or they make it look as look like the person is able to control the wolf. Like in Twilight, after a while, after resisting and stuff, the guy is now in control of the wolf. So he can change to the wolf when he wants and basically control the power of the wolf. Then when he has finished, he can change back to a human being. But that's a deception from, from the pit of hell. Anybody who allows this spirit to overtake him will be controlled by the spirit. Anybody who allows himself to go down this road, anybody who travels this alternative lifestyle and goes down the path long enough will be like the, the original werewolf who the person who changes to a wolf is controlled by the wolf, is taken over by the wolf, and the wolf is the one that is using the person and destroying things with the person. 
So this this tendency, this homosexual tendency, it's a controlling tendency. It doesn't allow people to control it. Anybody who allows himself to fall under the grip of this tendency will be controlled by this tendency, will be consumed by this tendency, and will be destroyed by this tendency. So let's look at a couple of articles, right? Keep in mind that these articles are not Christian articles. They are not written by Christians. This is just secular research. So this is from the United States Census Bureau. It says, LGBT adults report anxiety, depression at all, at all ages. Mental health struggles higher among LGBT adults than non-LGBT adults in all age groups. It says, regardless of age, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender adults have consistently reported higher rates of symptoms of both anxiety and depression than non-LGBT adults during the COVID-19 pandemic. It says, previous Census Bureau research showed that LGBT adults, both those living alone and with others, experience more mental health challenges than non-LGBT respondents. This is another research. The Trevor's Project 2023 survey also asked, asked questions about the mental health of LGBT youth and their ability to access care. Here are some of the findings. 70% of LGBTQ teens experienced symptoms of anxiety in the past year. 57% of LGBTQ teens experienced symptoms of depression. Among all LGBT, LGBTQ youth surveyed, ages 13 to 24, 81% wanted mental health care in the past year. So there are other surveys that I read, but I didn't want to put them all in the video so it doesn't become too long. But basically, some of the surveys said that people who are in the LGBTQ community are up, are up to four times, they have a greater risk of anxiety, depression, and even suicide. And that risk is four times more than people who are not in the LGBTQ community. Let's read one, one other survey. This is from the National Institutes of Health. It says, researchers find disparities in suicide risk among lesbian, gay, and bisexual adults. It says, the study, which examined data from a nationally representative survey of adults in the United States, also showed that lesbian, gay, and bisexual adults are overall more likely to report suicide-related thoughts, plans, and attempts within the past 12 months compared with heterosexual adults. So this lifestyle is a destructive lifestyle. When you read many of these um, surveys, keep in mind that the people who do these surveys and this research are not spiritual people. They're just secular people. They're just normal people living their lives who don't know God and don't understand spirituality. So when they attempt to explain things, they can only explain it from the physical. They can't, accept, they can't understand the spiritual backing or the spiritual dimension of anything. So they only explain things from the physical. So when they did this research, many of the researchers were shocked. They were shocked at the disparity and the fact that people in this particular community are at risk of mental health, suicide, depression, and all sorts of other things that are not good, basically. Their risk is far higher than straight people or heterosexual people. And the, the way they were able to rationalize or explain this, the way they explain this is because people in the LGBTQ community are subject to cyberbullying or bullying and harassment as a result of their sexual orientation. So if anybody didn't understand what I just said, basically, people bully them because they are gay, people harass them, people insult them. And because they are insulted and harassed, it's easier for them to become depressed and to commit suicide. While that 
may be true there's also a spiritual dimension to this there's also a spiritual aspect so let's read a scripture first samuel 16 verse 14 it says but the spirit of the lord departed from saul and an evil spirit from the lord troubled him so saul had been living in disobedience for a long time doing things that god asked him not to do living his own lifestyle different from what god asked him to do god gave him commandments he wouldn't keep them and worst of all he wouldn't repent he would stay in his rebellion so he stayed in this rebellion to a point that he opened up himself to an evil spirit and when this evil spirit came the bible says the evil spirit troubled him so that trouble it means to depress it means to depress it means to we you know when somebody is troubled you are not at peace you are not happy he was constantly troubled he was depressed he was tormented by this evil spirit so when this evil spirit fell upon Saul the first thing that happened to him was depression he was very depressed the second thing we can see from Saul is he became very he was subject to fits of rage he became angry right you see him do things that a normal person will not do for instance he killed all the priests because he was looking for david and we also see another time where david was playing a harp and saul put he took up a javelin and attempted to pin david to the wall with a javelin The third thing we see with Saul, so follow the trend, right? An evil spirit came upon Saul, and first he was depressed, heavily depressed. Second, he became very angry, right? Very irritable, and even to the point of murderously angry. Then the third thing we see with Saul is that he committed suicide. He committed suicide how if you if you know anything about how Saul died he actually died by suicide so we see the same traits in the lgbt community we see depression we see a lot a lot of anger and vitriol and we also see suicide these things are spirits or can be caused by spirits they are not just natural things like that right and it's because they are living a lifestyle that is in brazen opposition to what god wants to what god stipulates it's 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 a direct assault on the laws of god right and somebody may say but some other people are also disobeying god some people are liars some people are cheats some people are thieves some people are fornicators how come the LGBT people are the ones that are at risk of depression, suicide, and anger. It is true, many people are breaking God's laws. Liars, thieves, cheats, and fornicators are also breaking God's law. But the thing about sin is that different sins bring different consequences. Every sin does not open the door, open the same door, and does not bring on the same consequences. So somebody who is a murderer right he the consequence of his sin is different from somebody who is an adulterer or a fornicator the kind of doors you open spiritually the kind of demons you draw to yourself for instance when you kill your child is different from somebody who is sleeping with somebody who is not his wife or somebody who, who he is not married to so both of them will have consequences both of them will face the repercussions of their iniquity but specific to a man sleeping with a man or a woman sleeping with another woman, the consequences specific to this seem to be anger, depression, and a higher tendency of suicide. So let's keep reading. Keep in mind, like, like I said, all these articles are not read, written by Christians. These are just secular people just living their lives. So this is seven major health disparities affecting the lgbt community so the first one it says sexually transmitted infections 
In the United States, gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men are most affected by HIV. Adolescent and adult gay and bisexual men made up 68% of new HIV diagnosis in the United States. It says gay and bisexual men are also at a higher risk for other STIs than others. Chlamydia, syphilis, and gonorrhea also significantly increase the risk of getting and transmitting HIV. Additionally, some evidence suggests that LGBTQ people are more likely to have the human papilloma virus, HPV. Gay, bisexual, and MSM are 20 times more likely than heterosexual men to develop in our cancer. Substance abuse. Research suggests that substance abuse is more prevalent in the LGBTQ plus community than in the non-LGBTQ plus community. Research has found that people who identify as lesbian or gay are more than twice as likely as people who identify as heterosexual to abuse alcohol or tobacco. And people who identify as bisexual are three times as likely. Also, some evidence suggests that transgender people are 2.5 times more likely to use drugs like methamphetamines and cocaine than cisgender people. Mental health conditions. Research has found that transgender or gender non-conforming adolescents are likelier to have attention deficit disorders and depressive disorders than non-transgender or non-conforming youth. Other evidence suggests that LGBTQ people are more likely to have poorer mental health outcomes than heterosexual people. Queer and transgender people tend to be more prone to anxiety, depression, suicidality, eating disorders, and substance dependence. Obesity and eating disorders. Research has found that bisexual and lesbian women are more likely to be overweight or obese than women who identify as heterosexual. However, gay men are less likely to be overweight or obese than straight men. Evidence suggests that eating and body image disorders may be more common among LGBTQ people than others. Breast and cervical cancers. Although, although there isn't conclusive evidence, breast and cervical cancers may disproportionately affect the LGBTQ community. For example, some research suggests that lesbian and bisexual women have a higher risk of breast cancer than others. Increased substance abuse and stress among lesbian and bisexual women compa compared to the general population may contribute to that risk. Heart disease. Research has found that lesbian, gay, and bisexual adults have a higher risk of heart disease and other cardiac problems than others. Lesbian, gay, and bisexual adults may be more likely to smoke and have poorer controlled blood sugar, both of which contributes to heart disease. So these are some of the ways in which the spirit of homosexuality will eventually consume the individual. Anger, depression, suicide, and a lot of disease are part of the consequences for breaking this particular law of God. And these are just physical things. This is just on the physical side, right? These are just things that you can measure with science, test in a lab. There are also spiritual consequences for breaking this law. For a man sleeping with a man, or a woman sleeping with another woman. There are spiritual consequences. There are things that will happen to the person that will not have been able to happen otherwise. But because they have broken this particular law, they open themselves up. So, I'm not going to talk about that in this video. Maybe in another video, we can go into the spiritual consequences of homosexuality. So, what is the solution? It's not a helpless case. Because there's nothing that Jesus cannot solve or the blood of Jesus cannot solve. So I'm going to give you the solution in steps. I'm going to give you the solution in steps. 
So the first step is to repent. You have to actually repent. Step number two is to know that God loves you. God doesn't hate you. God is not angry with you. God doesn't condemn you. God doesn't think less of you compared to anybody who is not living in this lifestyle. God, Jesus died for you. Even before you became a Christian, he died for you, knowing all the life choices you were going to make, and he loves you regardless. So you have to know that God loves you. The third step, let's read one scripture before we get into the third step. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we read it earlier, but we'll go further from verse 9. It says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. And such were some of you. Past tense. And such were some of you. So when this topic is handled, people handle it and talk about it as if it's something that cannot be changed. So I was born like this. Therefore, there's nothing that can be done. It can be changed. It's just who I am. And I just have to live with it until I die. But the Bible says otherwise. He says, and such were some of you. So some people came into this church as fornicators, but they were no longer fornicators. They came in as idolaters. They were no longer idol worshippers. They came in as adulterers. They were no longer adulterers. And some came in gay and were no longer gay. Some came in as homosexuals. And after encountering Jesus, they were no longer homosexuals. So Jesus is able to change your sexual orientation. It's not something that cannot be. There's nothing God cannot do. The Bible says with God, all things are possible. So it's not like it's an impossible task and there's nothing that can be done. It can be changed. So you're asking yourself, why is my own why has mine not been changed? Why have I not been able to overcome? Why have I been gay and I'm not able to be straight? So the first step, like I said, is repentance. The second step is to know that God loves you. The third step is what we're looking at now, is to know that you can actually come out of it. You can change your lifestyle with the power of God. And the fourth step, let me read the scripture before I give you the fourth step. Romans 6, 14. It says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. It says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. So Apostle Paul is painting a scripture where somebody is fighting with an urge, a sin, a desire. So it's something that wants to take over him, and he doesn't want to take over him. He doesn't want that urge to take over him. So there is the battle, right? But he's letting us know that under the power of grace, right? The grace comes with the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, they were under the law. They don't have the Holy Spirit. But you are under grace. You have a spirit of holiness that dwells inside you. So this spirit of holiness helps you to live holy. Therefore, sin cannot have dominion over you. But you have to acknowledge that it's a sin. You have to acknowledge that it's a sin. You can't say this is just how I am. If you say this is just how I am, it will have dominion over you because you are not acknowledging that it's a sin. You have to acknowledge that it's a sin. It's not just how I am. It's not just a lifestyle. It's not just I just desire men as a man or I just desire women as a woman. You have to acknowledge that it's a sin. It may not be your fault. You may actually have been born like that. Right, but you have to acknowledge that it's a sin. If you don't acknowledge that it's a sin, there is no deliverance, there is no rescue, there is no coming out of it. It takes humility to actually come to God and say, Actually, this thing is a sin, and I want to be delivered. Sometimes, in pride, right, people do, may not want to admit that, it, that there is something 
wrong. That there's something wrong that I need help to change. It makes you feel like you are an invalid or it makes you feel like something is wrong with you or you are less than the rest of the population. To admit that there's something wrong that and actually I need help, it makes you almost feel like a leper. But it's necessary. It's necessary. The Bible says the meek shall inherit the earth. Jesus came to save the meek, the broken-hearted, the ones who are able to humble themselves and say that, actually, I have a problem. The Bible says that he will, but what, how does it say it in Isaiah chapter 13? He says that he will bring down the proud, the pride of the arrogant. So those who are proud, the Bible says God is going to bring them down. It is pride to refuse to admit that you have a problem. It is easier to just say, oh, that's just how I am and move on. Because you don't want to admit that this thing is making me feel like a leper. But to move on, to actually come out of it, you have to humble yourself and admit that it is sin. In Second Chronicles 7.14, popular scripture that everybody quotes, it says that if the people, but if my people who are called by their name will humble themselves and pray, and turn, seek my face, turn from my wicked ways, I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. So these people's land is being ravaged, is being destroyed. But to humble themselves and actually ask God for help, they are feeling proud. And because they are feeling proud, their land will forever be destroyed. But it says if they humble themselves, he will forgive the sin. Because Jesus doesn't condemn you if you want to repent. If you are truly repentant, he won't condemn you. So when they humble themselves to pray, he will forgive the sin, right? And then he will heal their land. So healing comes after humility, repentance, then the healing will come. So the first step is to repent. Repent of rebelling against God, every lifestyle you've lived, everything you've been doing that you know is a sin that has brought you to this condition now. You actually have to repent. Second, you need to know that God loves you. He doesn't condemn you. He doesn't hate you. He doesn't look down on you. He doesn't think other people who are not doing this are, are better than you or are more Christian than you. No, he doesn't think that. The third step is to know that sin cannot have dominion over you. Is to know that some people were like that, but when they came to the church, Jesus rescued them. Is to believe that you can come out of it because it says some. So this is how some of you were and such way. So you must believe that you can come out of it. You must believe. Don't say this is how I am. Don't say, oh, this is just how it is. We just have to accept it. Everything in this kingdom works by faith. Faith is not just to receive a car, to receive a house, to be blessed. If you're in any sin and you don't believe you can overcome, you won't overcome. Not because Jesus can't save you, but because you don't believe you can overcome. It always works by faith. So what the devil does is to come and tell you that you can never come out of it. Just accept it is how it is. It's your life now. You were born with it. Yada, yada, yada. But once you take that bite of the of of, of whatever he's selling and you internalize it and you believe it, it kills your faith. And once it kills your faith, you can't be rescued. So what I would advise you to do after taking these four steps, repenting, knowing that God loves you, knowing that you can come out, and knowing that admitting that it's a sin, is to go on a fast. I would advise you to go on a fast, a three-day fast, where you drink only water. In this fast, you will take these two scriptures, Romans chapter 6 verse 14 and 1 Corinthians 6 from verse 9 to 11, especially verse 11, which says, and such were some of you. So Romans 6 14, which talks about having dominion over sin and 1 Corinthians 6 11. You will pray the scriptures daily. You will fasten your mind to them. You will hold God in humility and ask him for deliverance. The reason I'm asking you to fast is that fasting is one of the ways to actually reduce, to live a holy life, basically, to reduce the strength of your flesh. 
So there are three categories of sin, right? First John 2, 16. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Every sin in the world can be, can be categorized either as lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. So for the sins that are the lust of the flesh, they are resident in your flesh. They are fleshly things, things your flesh, like literally your flesh wants. Things like fornication and stuff like that. So they are fleshly sins. It's not like a mental thing. So pride can be a mental thing, right? But things like fornication and even homosexuality, they are things that your flesh desires. So when you fast, what you are doing is you are weakening your flesh. Right, so one of the things that pleasures your flesh or gives your flesh, your physical flesh now, not the sinful flesh, your body is food. So when you don't eat, physically you become weaker. You're not as strong, right? Your flesh is becoming weaker. So that is, it symbolizes what's going on spiritually. You know, when you read the Bible, it's only nowadays that people only fast because they want God to bless them or they're asking for a house or you're asking for a car. But if you read the Bible, people fast to repent from sin, right? For instance, when David slept with Bathsheba and God confronted him, he actually went on a fast, a three-day fast, to tell God that he was sorry, right? If you read the scriptures, many other times when the Israelites sinned, they actually fasted. In Jonah, when Jonah confronted the people in Nineveh, when they wanted to repent, they actually went on a fast. So these biblical examples show us that when people are struggling with sin, especially fleshly sins, Right. If you're here for kitchen, it's also for you. If you're here masturbating, it's also for you. When you stop eating, what it does is it weakens your physical flesh. But that is symbolic of what is happening spiritually. It's weakening the fleshly nature of man so that your spiritual man can grow. It's weakening your fleshly nature so that your spirit is stronger. So that when the urge comes from your flesh, right? It says the spirit lost against the flesh, the flesh against the spirit. These two are contrary one to another. So that over time, when the urge comes to do what you are not supposed to do, right? If you are made fast in a regular practice, it doesn't have to be like every day or every month, Seth, but a regular practice, your flesh has become weak. So you can actually tell your flesh, I will not masturbate. People who don't fast, pleasure, pleasure, pleasure their flesh. When the urge comes, even though in their spirit they don't want to do it, but because the flesh is so strong, they haven't starved it. It's not weak, right? The flesh eventually will overpower the spirit. So fasting regularly, like I said, it doesn't have to be every day or even every month, but you must fast regularly. What it does is it kills, it weakens. It keeps weakening the flesh. It lets your flesh know that you are under my control. When you can tell yourself, I will not eat for the next three days or one week or 21 days, right? You will grow to a point where spiritually you can tell your flesh, I will no longer fornicate. And there's nothing you can do about it. Your flesh can't force you. Just like in the realm of the physical, when you tell yourself, I will not eat till 12. Even if your stomach growls forever, that's your stomach's business. There's nothing you can do. It's under your control. So spiritually, that's what fasting also does. So go on a fast, right, for three days. Drink only water for those three days. In those three days, also abstain from other things that pleasure your flesh. Remember, you're trying to kill your flesh. What people don't know about fasting is that fasting is not just abstaining from food. It's actually a killing of the flesh, a starving of the flesh, a weakening of the flesh. So in addition to not eating, you will starve other things that give your flesh pleasure. Anything else that will pleasure your flesh, you will starve it. In plain terms, I'm saying you will not watch series. You will not watch movies for those three days. You will not play video games. If they invite you for a party, you are not going. If they invite you for to the beach, you are also not going. If anybody calls you and wants to be wasting your time on the phone and be calling and be talking long gist, this is not the time for long gist. You are not on Instagram. You are not on Twitter. You are killing everything. Anything that will pleasure your flesh, it's time to destroy it and face God for those three days. If you do this with all of your heart, truly, and you want to be delivered, God will hear you. And he will begin to speak to you. You will hear the voice of the Holy Spirit in your spirit. He will begin to speak to you and give you further instructions on what you should do. For some of you, the Holy Spirit may, will, will ask you to extend the fast. 
for some of you. The Holy Spirit will show you the particular doors that you opened that allowed this to happen to you. He will give you flashbacks of maybe when you were in school, you did this. When you were in, five years ago, you did this, you went to do this, you did this. And when you did those things, you just got up and moved on. But you will not know that those things opened doors that allowed urges that are not natural to come to you. So when those things happen, you have to repent of those specific sins. You have to repent. You have to go on your knees, tell God you are sorry, I'm sorry, and close that door once and for all. When you do this, God will deliver you. After you've been delivered, once in a while, you may feel the urge for some time. Right? It's just like somebody who has been fornicating, 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 and he repents and God delivers him. Once in a while, he will still feel like sleeping with somebody who is not, he is a human being, he has urge, so he may still feel like sleeping with somebody who is not his wife. But that doesn't mean that he has not been delivered from the spirit of loss. All he has to do is enforce his victory and say, no, I was fornicating, I will no longer fornicate. So after you've gone through this process and you know you have been delivered, in case once in the, once once for a period of time after that, right, not forever, for a period of time after that, if the urge comes back again, don't now feel like God has failed you and you haven't come out of it, right? You just have to rebuke it and keep on moving with your life and believe in God. So I'm not saying that at the end of these three days you will be fully delivered, right? All I'm saying is, when you go into this, God will give you further steps. This is like the opening of the door. And as you follow him to leading in your spirit, eventually you will come out of it. It's possible after three days you will come out of it. But it's possible that it may take longer. But like the scripture says, as such where some of you, anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord, will be saved. So what do I do if I have a child... That's a homosexual. First of all, let's read the scripture. Daniel chapter 9 from verse 4. This is Daniel. He's speaking. He says, And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and the mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly. And have rebelled, even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. What do I do if I have a son or a daughter or somebody under my care who has become a homosexual? You also have to repent. You have to repent. You have to repent. For the things that you are supposed to be doing as a parent that you did not do. The times you allowed your child go where they were not supposed to go because you were scared to correct them. The times you allowed them watch ungodly movies. You allowed them listen to ungodly songs. You were not there to guide them, to shepherd them, to see this is wrong, this is right. The times you allow them to stay up late or go out late and just go to any party they want, keep any friend they want. The times you fail to guide them according to the precepts and the commandments of the Lord. Basically, the times you fail to draw a boundary between the clean and the unclean. The times you failed as a parent to actually guide these children. Because it's most likely that in one of those instances where you allow them to watch where they were not supposed to watch, go where they were not supposed to go, play video games that are demonic without you even noticing. You weren't checking their phones, you weren't monitoring their, monitoring their friends. You basically did not correct them. It is through one of these things that they have contacted what they have contacted now. So the first step is to repent. And tell God, I didn't play my part as a, as a parent. I didn't play it well. I wasn't really praying with my child on a daily basis. I wasn't teaching them the Bible. And I also didn't stop them from going into iniquity. I basically let them live as they liked. I wasn't checking them. I wasn't monitoring them. See what has happened. So God is merciful. He's not going to hold anything against you. But repentance is key. 
The Bible says, He that confesseth and forsaketh his sin shall have mercy. It says, He that confesseth and forsaketh his sin shall have mercy. So the key to obtaining mercy from the Lord is to actually confess our sins. To confess our sins before him in humility. Right? And then we can obtain mercy. So the second step is also to confess and ask for mercy on behalf of your child. So Daniel in this passage was not really asking God for mercy just for himself. Remember they had gone into captivity and the reason they had gone into captivity is the sins of their fathers and their forefathers. So when he was praying, right, you can read the whole chapter, he was asking God to forgive them forgive the sins of their fathers, their forefathers, their great-great-grandfathers, and people who had walked in iniquity and rebellion and basically landed them in captivity. So you also have to repent on behalf of your child because chances are that they are also not living a godly lifestyle. Chances are that they are also doing things, indulging in things, and have completely rebelled against God and gone off the handle, Right? So you also have to repent on behalf of the child. After repenting on behalf of the child, you have to show the child love, right? You even have to be more loving now. Any form of antagonism will be, will be, what's the word I'm looking for? The devil will pounce, pounce on that antagonism and use it to drive the child further and further into the lifestyle. Any form of antagonism, hatred, or those kind of things. The devil will capitalize on it and tell the child, say, you see, your parents don't love you. The only people who love you are your homosexual friends. So you basically tell the child, cut off from your parents, stop listening to them, stop talking to them, stop even coming home. Just go and live with your male boyfriends. And that will drive the child farther and farther into destruction. So you have to love the child. Like truly show love, be patient, let the child know that you love them despite what is going on. So you love them, but you are not affirming the lifestyle. You have to let the child know that you love them, you'll be there for them, you show them care, nothing is going to change, you're going to love them as normal. In fact, you have to start loving them more than, than before. You have to be patient, God has to help you to truly be patient. But you will not affirm the lifestyle, right? You will lovingly let them know that... You don't affirm the lifestyle. You don't think it's the best for them, right? And you are going to love them and continue being a parent, but you are not in support of this lifestyle. The third step is to understand that this issue has a spiritual dimension to it. So you have to be prayerful. You have to stay in prayer and allow the Holy Spirit lead you on how to relate to the child and steps to take, right? Many people look at this as, as if it's like you're drinking a cup of water, then just stop drinking it. You can just put it down anytime you want, right? But drinking a cup of water doesn't have any spiritual side to it. It's just a cup of water. But when people are ensnared in this lifestyle, apart from the fact that sometimes they, their own will, they want it, their will is in it, right? They will it for themselves. There's also a spiritual dimension to it. There's a form of influence, a spiritual influence that is driving them into that lifestyle. So you have to be prayerful. It's not something you just approach and with English and just be talking and trying to advise and convince. Thank God for that. But you have to stay in prayer. You have to be spiritual and God has to lead you. So the fifth step is to contact your pastor. All right, I'm on the internet. I don't know you. Right, I don't know the child. I don't know how old the child is. I don't know whether it's a boy or girl. I don't know the the specific circumstances that apply to that child or where the child has been the kind of friends how long the person has lived this lifestyle how far gone is it in is it a secret is it something they're doing openly i don't have those details and those details will be necessary to prov to provide adequate support right to whoever is going through this so you need to consult a pastor a Bible-believing pastor, not the one who will tell you that, no, it's fine, that God doesn't mind. A truly Bible-believing pastor who can ask you questions, who knows you, probably 
has been your pastor for a while probably knows the child saw the child grow up and everything so he will have access to all these details and because he's closer to you he will be able to provide more help basically he will be he will be of more help to you than i can be on the internet so what i've given you i just you know how you go to a doctor and the doctor is a gp a general practitioner he just gives you general steps, right? Then after that, he will refer you to a specialist. So I've given you the general steps. Repent for yourself. Repent for your child. Love the child. Know that this is a spiritual battle, right? It's not just physical. So you have to pray, right? Be prayerful. And after this, I'm now referring you to a pastor. So for, for both cases, for those who are dealing with this themselves, right? You have to also, if you haven't been praying and reading your Bible, you have to do that, right? Because you can't leave yourself open. You have to pray. You have to be reading your Bible. You have to make prayer and study of the Word, right? You have to make it regular, your regular practice, so that you can choke out this lifestyle. So, when I was in school, I was in, how old was I? I don't know, maybe like, I can't remember, maybe like 13, 14, maybe 15, I can't remember, but I was really young, I was in uni- I was in secondary school, so I hadn't gotten into college yet. One of my, I won't call him a friend, basically, a classmate introduced me to pornography. So... After I indulged in this pornography for a while, I ran into what the Bible describes as a companion of spirits. A companion of spirits. Jesus said, he says that when a wicked spirit or an evil and unclean spirit is born out of a man, he says he walketh upon dry places, right? And when he comes back, he says, I'll go back to my house, he comes back, he finds the place swept and kept. The Bible says he taketh to himself seven more wicked spirits. So basically, when an unclean spirit has been driven away from a man, he will first go wander about. When he's now uncomfortable, he hasn't found any other resting place. He will now return to the man. But when he comes back, he will come back with seven other spirits he will not come alone his bible says seven spirits more wicked than himself so these spirits are not the same as him they are different in their operation and they are also different in the magnitude of their wickedness the magnitude of their wickedness is different their strength what they have capacity to achieve what they have capacity to compel a man to do is different so the main point I'm trying to help you to understand is that a spirit can drive, can bring in another spirit. If you allow one spirit, right, he will not stay alone forever. If you keep entertaining him, keep entertaining him, eventually he will draw his fellow brethren, his other spirits, they will now come and join. So I was watching pornography, right? And after indulging it for a while, I began to notice that some of these urges started to I started to experience them. These homosexual urges that I never had before, not even once. From nowhere, I just started feeling like seeing a man as if he's a woman, basically. But I refused to accept them. I was very young. I was just a teenager then. And I also didn't know the Lord then. But I knew it was wrong. Deep down, I knew it was wrong. If I not deep down, even on the surface level, I knew it was wrong. So I refused to accept that this is who I was. I refused to accept that it is normal. I refused to accept that, you know, this is just how I am. This is just whatever. No, no, no. I fought it. And keep in mind that I didn't even know the Lord then. If I had known the Lord then, I would have even added scriptures and prayer and everything and whatever. But but eventually, those urges left. 
God delivered me completely. And if he did it for me, he can also do it for you. Another thing that was happening. Okay, so one of the reasons. So let me talk about this first. So a spirit can draw in another spirit. Right, that's the point I was making. Right, how this other homosexual spirit was able to start suggesting things to me. Or that I opened the door to lust through pornography. So what I was watching was straight porn. Right, it was it was an immorality. I was contacting a spirit of immorality, immorality through pornography. But eventually he brought his companion, which is homosexuality. So when you engage the spirit of lust, that spirit of lust will now eventually tell you that I am a spirit of lust and I can make you lust after women or men. I am not really particular. Is either he will do it himself or he will draw in one of his other spirits who is a hardcore homosexual spirit. And you who is a street man, street woman, will suddenly look at your fellow woman's breast and be wondering what it is like. So you who is engaging in what is wrong, watching all these godless movies, watching all these secular movies, where people are kissing, smooshing, fornicating. Some of you are even watching movies where men are kissing other men. Listening to gay artists who are openly gay and just doing all kinds of godless things. You will catch homosexuality. It don't be a joke, honestly. I'm just warning you now. Because you think, oh man, I'm just doing the one that is straight. He will bring seven other wicked spirits. More wicked than himself. Keep in mind that some of the people who are ensnared in this lifestyle now also started out straight. You may be saying, oh, don't worry, it will never happen to me. I can never sleep with another man. They also said the same thing. It will never happen to me. I'm as straight as an arrow. Today they are coming out of the closet. So you have to be guided. Some of you who are busy for fornicating, sleeping around, you will not know when you will sleep with somebody who is bi. You will sleep with the person who is bi, and you too will, f- you will first get up by. When you finish sleeping with the person, when you get up, you will now know, you will not know that you are no longer completely straight. You will get up by. How it will start is, you will just be sitting there in church one day, as they are preaching as a woman, you will be looking at your fellow woman's bum bum. You will be wondering where this odd came. As a man, you will be looking at your fellow man's lips, and you will first start by saying, I rebuke it, God forbid, where this thing starts from, it can never be me. And you, you will... F- <laughs> You will not know where that urge will leave you. You will not know where it came from. But it was a sexual encounter you had with somebody who was either bi or somebody who just said, let me experiment. Let me as a man sleep with another man or as a woman sleep with another woman. And they did it once. But when they did it once, they contacted homosexuality. They contacted the spirit. That one does not even know he's already on his way to homosexuality. He thinks he's fine. So he now will come and sleep with you and you too will get it. So the only way to be guarded and be guided and be completely defended is to stay within the boundaries of the word of God. If God says don't touch it, don't touch it. Don't look at it, don't look at it. Don't watch it, don't watch it. Don't listen to it, don't listen to it. Don't fornicate, don't fornicate. Anything God says don't do. It is the word of God that forms a boundary that keeps us protected from these spirits. If you think you will do it by your will, that I'm so strong, I will resist, or I can never be attracted to a man. You've not met a spirit. Spirits are far more powerful than you think. They will make you do things that you will be shocked. You will never know you could have ever done it in your life. So the only way is that you stay within the boundaries of the word of God. That's how you will stay protected. Another thing we need to understand. If you study the story of Samuel, and Saul in the Bible, right? So Saul came to Samuel to be anointed after looking for his father's donkey. He met Samuel, Samuel anointed him, and Samuel told him to leave, and as he leaves, he'll meet a band of prophets, some will be playing instruments, some will have, one will have bread, and he will meet them, they will give him the bread, and he too will prophesy, right? So Saul left there, met a band of prophets. Sam, Saul is not a prophet, those ones are the ones that are prophets. Band of prophets. Strong prophets. 
and there's this strong prophetic atmosphere because as they came down they were still praising god playing the instruments and so on and so forth so paul eh, sorry saul encountered that strong prophetic atmosphere and under that strong prophetic atmosphere he too began to prophesy he's not a prophet but under that strong prophetic atmosphere he began to prophesy and people said he saw also among the prophets is he among the prophets so atmospheres are very strong and being in the wrong atmosphere for long enough and being there undefended will compel you to do whatever the spirit in that atmosphere is doing if you stand under the wrong atmosphere for long enough and you are undefended that atmosphere will compel you to bend to the shape of the atmosphere so going back to when i was in school right I had no idea that in my school, or the boys hostel, or the boys hostel, boarding school, homosexuality was rampant. Like people were busy doing it. If I never saw them, I never knew. Or I was so young, I was so innocent. So I did see some things that when I look back now, it's obvious that these guys were, were homosexuals, closet homosexuals. It was, it's very clear to me now, as an adult, that these guys were clearly homosexuals. But they were doing it in the closet. But it wasn't so hidden. You will see one or two signs. But it was it's clear as an adult. But because then I was so young and I was innocent, those things in, you know, it's like as a grown man, if a man is making advances at you, you know that this man likes you, he's interested. But if you were like seven years old as a girl and you see a man making advances at another woman, you don't know what's going on because you are too young to understand romance. So I was so young. That I couldn't understand that these people are actually geese, that they are busy doing what they are not supposed to be doing under the cover of darkness. So these guys, this thing was so rampant, especially in the part of the hostel where I was. People were just doing it anyhow. And it was a strong spiritual atmosphere of homosexuality. It was it looking back now, now that I'm I'm mature and I can see with the eyes of the spirit was it was like a cloud of darkness, strong. A cloud dead, even my room, strong, thick darkness that clouded my room. So I was there and I was not prayerful because I didn't know God. So I wasn't praying, just living my life, everything, just, you know, just, just, just going to school and coming back. A lack of prayer. Then I made it worse by now watching pornography. That was now like the, the crown. I opened the just if the door was just ajar before now I blasted the door of the hinges so lack of prayer plus being in the wrong atmosphere allowed those spirits to now begin to suggest and almost bend my will to become a homosexual so you cannot be found in the wrong atmosphere as a Christian Christians that are going for gay pride <laughs> Hmm, I, I'm just smiling. I'm laughing. If you see me now, I'm smiling at you. I'm smiling at you. Christians that are going for gay pride. Christians that they're having a gay party in your office. You have gay friends. They say, we're having a gay get-together. And because you don't want to offend them, you carry yourself there to where people, everybody is gay. And they are strengthening themselves under the power of this. You wish, you and you are not praying. You don't read your Bible. You are just going to church Sunday, come back, just being a, a casual, happy, go lucky, botty, ajebota, soft. You will be shocked though that this spirit will overpower you. So you cannot be found in this kind of atmosphere. There is a gay wedding. You can never be found there, sir. You can never be found at a gay wedding. You should never be found at a gay bar. Never be found in a in gay pride or anything that celebrates or acknowledges and, and entrenches this spirit. You can never be found there because Saul can be among the prophets. You will be shocked what can start happening to you. You will be shocked how you will be overpowered by these things. So prayer is necessary. Prayer is very necessary because we are in warfare and these spirits are moving up and down. 
So any Christian who gets up, just goes to work on back, leaves his house without prayer, eventually you will be unguarded. Eventually you will not be defended because the Bible says be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, is roaring about like a roaring lion. The only way to be sober is in prayer. You can't be sober and watch for the devil and be vigilant with your eyes, your physical eyes. Nobody can see the devil with his eyes. So when he says be sober and be vigilant, it is by prayer. It is by prayer. So Christians just wake up in the morning, they don't pray, just go. When you do that for many years, if this spirit lay holds on you, your flesh will be too weak to resist it. Don't say it cannot happen to me. Oh. Ha. Don't say, it. say let he that think it is standard. Take it. Lest you will be shocked how far you will go. Don't ever say it won't happen to me. You must strengthen yourself in prayer. Then when they invite you for these gatherings, you will look for how to politely tell them you are not coming. If you have gay friends, gay colleagues, and they say come for a gay birthday party or a gay wedding or whatever, and you don't want to offend them, you will now, I don't know how you're, you will schedule a, a meeting. Let's say they say oh, we're having a, be- a gay birthday party or a gay wedding on Saturday. You will now quickly call your wife or send a text to your wife and say, Sir, baby, let's go for dinner on Saturday. You will now check what time is the gay, gay, gay wedding. It's by five. You will now schedule your, you and your wife's dinner by five. So when they ask you, are you going, you will not reply the text and tell them, ah, me and my wife were so sorry we could have come, but we have a, a, a dinner. It's me and my wife's time to be romantic, and you go for the dinner. I'm giving you this, this example because I don't want you to lie. If they say, are you coming, then you will not make up something and lie because you don't want to go. So lying is also a sin, so I don't want you to lie. So you can use wisdom, any wisdom you want to use. This is one wisdom. You quickly schedule something and beg them and say, well, I'm so sorry. You can even buy them a gift. After all, we love, we love them. Jesus loves everybody. So you're not like you are not going because you hit them. You don't hit them. It's not like you're not going because you, you, are, you, are, you, you want God to punish them. You don't want God to punish them. It's just that you are becoming wise and you are guiding yourself. It's just like if I have a friend who is a witch, if she invites me to her coven, I will not now go to the coven because I don't want to offend her. Because I don't want to be called witch phobic. So she invites me to a gathering of witches where they are drinking blood. Then I'll say, because I don't want to be called a, a witch phobic, I will not carry myself to the witches. I will not carry myself to a witch's cover. So you cannot carry yourself to a gay gathering in the name of let them not call me homophobic. In one of the visions of the night, I saw. Many people becoming gay. It was like an epidemic. People who were just living their normal, everyday, ordinary lives. All of a sudden, they just found themselves. It started as a little attraction, just a little attraction to another man. Some while just being friends with someone of the same sex. Just being friends, innocent platonic friendship. They they just had a tiny, they shared just a tiny bit of homosexual affection and they found that they liked it. And from that tiny bit of affection they embraced the homosexual lifestyle it, it was happening on a widespread level and it was happening so subtly so subtly even the people it was happening to were unaware they were unaware that this was happening to them until it was too late. The people were like wrestlers. You know wrestlers in the WWE. You know how when wrestlers want to wrestle, they come in close contact, so they hold each other. They like hug each other sometimes. Not hug, but when they want to lift each other and slam the person, they hug each other. They jump on top of each other and everything. So the people were like wrestlers 
who were just wrestling, like normal wrestling, coming in contact, body slamming each other and everything. And in the midst of the wrestling, the innocent wrestling, I saw them, some of them. When, all of a sudden, when the other man's body came in contact with his body, as, as had been usually happening, instead of having to lift the person up and slam the person like they usually do, he now became aroused. Then I saw another one, the same thing happening to him. He would take his opponent and be about, he would be about to perform a move, maybe do his signature finishing move. But when his opponent's body comes in contact with his own body, he too becomes aroused. And they went from wrestling to basically practicing homosexuality, all of them. All the wrestlers, all of them, it just all of a sudden from innocent wrestling. And I asked the Lord, I knew what I knew what it meant later on that these were not just wrestlers. And I asked the Lord, How? How does this happen? And he said, indecent exposure. He said indecent exposure. So you know how wrestlers are dressed. They are always indecently dressed. So the men are basically stark naked. They chisel themselves, they body build, so they're very muscular. Then all the guy is wearing is a pant. And the pant is so tight, showing the whole shape of his buttocks. His nipples are exposed, his chest is exposed. Even the, his private part in front. The whole shape is showing because the pant is tight. So all of them are dressed like this, indecently exposed. So when his opponent came in contact with that indecent exposure, he became a homosexual. So this is a warning from Yah. To anyone who will touch the unclean thing, you will become a homosexual. Anyone who will watch what God asks him not to watch, listen to what he's not supposed to listen to, go where he's not supposed to go, have certain conversations he's not supposed to have, and instead of separating himself from the world, will stay in filth. And enjoy filth. You will become a victim of this. So let us pray. So I just want to pray with anyone. Who is going through this. I'm going to pray with you. And I know. That my God. Will help you. If you truly. Want to be helped. He will help you. So let us pray. Father, I command every chain of homosexuality to be broken now in the mighty name of Jesus. I ask for strength for anyone who is going through this to prevail. Strength to prevail. Strength to fight. Strength to go the long haul, the distance. Strength to not give up. I ask for strength not to be deceived by the evil one who will eventually come to them and say, just give up. You've been fighting for long. This is who you are. I ask for strength to tarry. I ask for grace to tarry in battle until they are victorious in the mighty name of Jesus. I ask for the love of God to embrace them. And this love of God to be so strong around them that it would fight off any form of condemnation. Either condemnation from people outside or even self-condemnation. I ask for the love of God which is shed abroad in, the Holy, by, in our hearts by the Holy Ghost to be so strong that there will be no space for condemnation. And I ask that you make everyone who is hearing this, who overcomes, I ask that you help, you make their life a testimony, that their life will be a testimony. It will be a shining light that will help others around them also to overcome. Thank you, Father, as you do this. 
In Jesus' name I pray.